pleasant good afternoon to listen public on ZBVI radio persons watching on Facebook live persons streaming on ZBVI radio the media uh, pleasant good afternoon I am Marlon Penn leader of the opposition and I'm here with my colleagues member for the third district Arnold Julian Fraser member, member Member for, for the second, second district, Arbor Melvin and Sturmo. And I give, give apologies to my colleague, Member for the fourth district, Arbor Mark Vandenpool, who's unable to be here with us this afternoon. We are here today as, as we have made a, a pledge and a promise and a commitment to the people of this territory to have our once a month press conferences with you, the media, and to have a dialogue with you, the public, um, in terms of the opposition as we fulfill our statutory requirement, our role as an opposition, to communicate with you, the public, on matters of interest to the people of this territory and this territory on a whole. Our last discussion with you was on the 19th of March, where we laid out uh, some specific concerns related to COVID-19 pandemic and some recommendations that we sought that were important for us as a territory moving forward. Subsequent to that discussion, we made a pledge to work along with the Honorable Premier and his government to ensure we do whatever is necessary to keep the people of this territory safe during this period, to ensure that everyone um, were able to, to go through this process in a safe um, and a productive manner. Some decisions were made. Um, we were in the process of, of, of working along and making sure that those decisions were made in your best interest. And early on in the process, one of the concerns that we raised, and one of was the, the, the main concerns were the issue of the economy during this pandemic and how, how we intended to work and, and bring a proper solution or plan to the people of this territory as it relates to the economy. We have subsequently, uh, and yesterday, launched a framework or plan that outlines uh, some key areas of interest through discussions with members of the public, through discussions with the business community and the wider analysis community where we've outlined some, some productive areas, areas specific to small business and workers and families, specific to the financial services industry, construction industry, fishing and farming, industry uh, and more specifically how are we going to jump start our tourism industry to ensure that we keep um, in a safe and productive way to ensure that we keep the economy moving and to ensure that we keep the people of this territory safe uh, we outline clearly in, in, in those in those plan documents we, we intend to bring forward to the public a more detailed document that outlines the specifics because we thought it was important for us to do this, specifically in tourism. We see the challenges that tourism has been closed for some two months. In our sister island in particular, are the areas who are most badly hit by the closure of tourism. Jasmine Dyke, um, Virgin Gorda, and Igorda. In particular, the, the economies are driven by tourism, tourism-related activity. And the lack of that activity uh, means that uh, the livelihood is at stake and we need to find a safe and product, a safe way to re reintroduce tourism into the economy. So we brought all ideas to the table. We've, we've as I said, we've worked with the Premier, we've, we've, we've asked for discussions on the economy, the economic plan. We went through that entire process and we thought it was prudent based on all the concerns that have been raised by members of the public. We know that a lot of persons are, are going through a very difficult time right now Persons have lost their jobs for over, over two, two plus months. Persons are, are concerned where the next um, payment will come from, where the next salary will come from, where the next um, um, businesses are concerned, where they, how they're going to keep their doors open. And they needed to, to hear some kind of ideas and plans coming out to really support and, and help them transition through this process. So we've done that. 
Uh, and it's important for us to open a dialogue. And the important thing for us was to ensure that the dialogue started as it relates to the economy. And, and, I've, and I must say that it started, we now have had a firm date from the Premier as to when he is going to release his plan. I think I heard on the news, I apologize for my mask, I heard on the news that the intention is to release this plan on 28th of this month, which is, a, which is a good sign. I mean that the dialogue is happening. I think we've already done our job to ensure that we have that dialogue in the public space. And we've already gotten feedback from persons from the business community and persons who have some ideas to bring forward in terms of what we're, produ what we're, what we're bringing forward, what we're suggesting. I think um, that's a good start. So again, is this, this press conference is our general press conference, our monthly press conference. The intention is just to, to start the dialogue, to continue the dialogue that we started in December when we started this series of, of meetings, and to have an engagement with you, the media. Um, the media are our friends. We, we, we value the media. We value your input. And we assure you that you are hope free to ask your question openly here with us here in the opposition um, as we engage you and engage the public. I also want to, again, thank the people of the territory for tuning in for, for the challenging time that you've been through over the last three, to three, three months, I would say, as we battle through this, this process with the COVID-19 pandemic. I know um, I want to, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that we, that good, fairly good job has done so far to keep you safe. Uh, I think we hope we continue that way, but I think that the discussion needs to shift now in terms of how we are going to get the economy going again. How are we going to support persons who are displaced on their jobs? How are we going to support individuals who are in a very bad position right now in the businesses that need the support and need to hear what the plans are moving forward in terms of getting the business going again? So again, Major, the, the floor is yours. We, we open the floor for you to ask whatever questions or comments you have. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask my colleagues first to, to make any contribution before we uh, open the floor to the media. Opposition has stated this is a part of our plan to be before you on a monthly basis. It seems like more than a month since we've been uh, sitting here to talk to you about the situation that we face with this COVID 19 pandemic and the state of territory. I have several issues. That I need to raise in public, which I've raised with the government on several occasions in public, and I'll continue to raise them until they are resolved. First and foremost, in this situation where our citizens, first and foremost, is the situation where our citizens are being prohibited to re enter the territory. Now, these are people who, the people that I am fighting for in particular, and this is, I'll get to the constitutional issue. The people that I'm fighting for in particular are people who live here, not people who live abroad and want to come home for whatever reason, but the people who live here. If you live in the Virgin Islands and you happen to have traveled to Puerto Rico for medical treatment, treatment that is not available here in the Virgin Islands, but you must go after Puerto Rico to get it. And during the period that you're there, and it, it's only overnight before the government closed the curtain and said that you can't come back. And you have your, your, your plane ticket already purchased because you, you, you only went for three days. 
You can come to St. Thomas, but you can't come back to Tortola. I mean, this, this is something that you can endure for two days, three days, four days, but three months, two months, it's unbelievable. This is unfathomable. And the government is to be responsible for bringing its citizens back home. This is something that's been happening throughout the world. The Israelis sent three 787s. These are aircrafts capable of carrying over 300 passengers one behind the other in one day from Israel to Peru to bring back its citizens. They talk about borders being closed. The borders are not, being, are not closed. They're, they're, uh, Airbus A380 is flying from, Ch from China to the United States daily. And what are they doing? Repatriating their citizens. The Germans are sending Lufthansa to Africa regularly to bring back its citizens. The UK is sending aircrafts all around the world to bring back its citizens. And we got our citizens right there in the United States, Virgin Islands, and they can't come home. Now hear me out on this. I know there are those of you who are saying that I'm being irresponsible for making such a statement or advocating for such, but this, that, that's not the case. Back in January, January 30th, I'm, I'm going to be specific, January 30th, the leader of the opposition insisted that the government have a briefing with the, the opposition, the members of the House of Assembly, including the opposition in particular, to discuss the situation of this upcoming virus. It wasn't here yet, as far as we know, to discuss what plans the Virgin Islands had for it. I myself was unable to make the meeting because I had a meeting scheduled that same evening in my district. But I was fortunate to have the minister attend that meeting after he was finished with the, the briefing in the House of Assembly. He came to my meeting. And he laid out the specifics as to what the Virgin Islands was about to do or what was going to do. And among those specifics was the preparation for people entering the territory, which included quarantine. And at the airport, uh, ports of entry, particularly the airport, so here I am on May 19th telling you that all citizens who live here should be allowed to come home. I've been advocating for this for a long time. Should be allowed to come home. And don't tell me that it's irresponsible because we should have the quarantine facilities for these people. So somewhere along the line, somehow, someone needs to answer for all this. And there are constitutional issues can't indefinitely impose these restrictions on individuals who has constitutional rights. You can't tell a citizen he can't come home. So, so we need to be responsible. The government is responsible for this and the government needs to act. And the government needs to make sure that this is corrected. Now, I've also been asking the government for an economic stimulus package. And that's not something that's unreasonable. We know that the conditions under which people are placed is not something of their own doings. For, for two weeks, 14 days or whatever you want, however many days you want to say in that area, 14 days a week, there's, there's the lockdown. Because the experts, the medical experts have, have said that if you isolate yourself for a certain period, puts the puts the um, the virus in remission if you have it uh, if you didn't have it before you wouldn't get it so we had a lockdown we had several several is incidents of uh, lockdown whether it was 24 hours or seven uh, or seven hours curfews and what have you but this thing is dragging on and dragging on and what are people to do if you ask me, if you tell me that I can't open my business, it means that I can't tra transact business. It means that there's no income. It means that my employees are at home. They can't work. And if they can't work, they can't make money. 
So that's a government imposed restriction on the people. So a government has a responsibility to ensure that people continue to function, to live. And a part of functioning and living is to be able to buy food. It's to be able to pay your basic expenses, such as your rent, your utilities. And I just told you that I'm not working, so where's this money to come from? 99% of the people in the Virgin Islands are working class people. And if you really want to know what it means to be a working class person, the definition for working class is a person who lives from paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, I've said it. They live from paycheck to paycheck. And if they don't get a paycheck, living seems to cease. And these are responsibilities of the government. Governments around the world, including Caribbean countries, has introduced stimulus packages for its citizens. To, as of now, the one that I see that has been published today, May 19th, it says that um, British Virgin Islands economic stimulus response. Now, stimulus response to me means responding to something. Is this a response to the, the, the leader of the opposition's uh, 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 stimulus proposal that he has made? Response. The, uh, now, you, you gotta, words matter. And it says response. Now, number one, purchase of testing kits, respirators, medical supplies, reconstruct and prepare quarantine space, public awareness campaign, etc. More than $12 million. Now, I don't know if the value of the dollar has dropped to that level where you can't really see $12 million in three months. Where, is this 12, where did this $12 million really go in this last few months, these last few months? And what does that have to do with well, it says stimulus response, so I don't think the public needs to be looking for any benefit from that. Purchasing of testing kits. How many testing kits did we buy? How many tests have we conducted? Remember the last time we checked, it was like 200 tests was conducted. It's not like thousands of tests were conducted. Respirators. I don't think we've attached a single individual to a respirator as yet. Medical supplies, we haven't had any, the few cases of, of COVID that we had. Then number two, it says food, medication, and other essentials for seniors and residents in need. Two million dollars. Food, medication, and other essentials for seniors and residents in need. Again, I go back to the value of the dollar. Number three, free water and delivery for water and sewage customers until June 1st, 2020. It's not a dollar value attached to that. Four, funding for farmers and fisher folks to ensure employment and territories food security, $2 million. Funding for farmers and fisher folks to ensure for territories food security, $2 million. Look out there. See any farming going on? I don't see it. The fisher folks, they can't go out on the waters anyway. They were prohibited from going out in the water. So there's $2 million somewhere that we can at that, that, that needs to be tapped into. If there's, if there's $2 million is available to farmers and fisher folks, believe me, somewhere there should be this humongous program trying to get the farmers and fisher folks up and running. And I don't see it. And I want to warn the government of something that they already know and something that was practiced after Hurricane Omar. 
that any such program, in order to be successful, the district representatives has to be involved. You're not gonna take $2 million and just spread it out and uh, just, just spew it out, and next thing you know, 80% of it is up from Barbas Bay East, or 80% of it is from um, Barbas Bay West, and anything north or south is just uh, happenstance or incidental. Five, creating jobs and business opportunities through house-to-house -house garbage collection and a government recycling program, $800,000. I, I, I'm shocked when I, I was shocked when I saw that because I didn't realize that the house-to-house -house garbage collection was a, 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 an initiative to create jobs. Mm -hmm. Where you came from? <laughs> I mean, like how? Hmm. If you had told me, well, we'll get 15 guys from my neighbor, 15 people from my district to go down to people's house and bring the garbage from the house up to the sidewalk, maybe you would be creating a job. I, no, I'm not for, for one moment suggesting that this should take place. I'm just thinking out loud as to how does this create jobs? Because the garbage was being picked up anyway. So if you're picking it up from house to house, it means that the guys who are picking it up from the bins are no longer working. So you didn't create any jobs. You know, these are, this document alone just can't stand. It needs to be um, explained away. Six, 500 laptops for students and teachers in need to ensure participation in online learning, $138,000. I've asked, uh, I, I've had parents ask me for computers. When I asked the minister, the minister told me there will be a, a loan program from the, from the, the government is establishing a loan program. I haven't heard how to tap into the loan program as yet. Meanwhile, I believe the students are busy trying to get their schoolwork done yeah. already. Right. Yeah. So they would have needed these computers from the get. So. 500 computers. How do you know that when you give a household a computer that it stays with that household? How do you know it doesn't end up somewhere else? This, this, is, this, this is... And I, I don't know what the, the purchasing arrangements were for these computers. Um, you see, that's, that's why I, I keep saying that the House of Assembly, members of the House of Assembly needs to be involved. I can't be sitting here saying that I don't know this and I don't know that and I don't know the other. And the reason I don't know is because we're not informed. Seven, stamp duty waiver for sale and transfer of land to belongers. Stamp duty waiver for sale and transfer of land to belongers. That one is something else. So you got money to buy land. Now, remember tourism, which is our number one economic pillar as far as sustaining our economy is concerned, is shut down. So you're gonna buy land. Are you buying land because you had money or you got money sitting on you want to just dispose of it and hold land? Or are you buying land because you need it in times like this? How, how does this stimulate the economy is the question. You buying land. You're not putting any money into the government's coffers in the form of taxes. So how does that stimulate the economy? I think, I think the government has got it, got it all wrong as far as what the public, what the, the country's needs are right now. People need, when you talk about a stimulus, what people need is assistance in getting through their daily lives. Tenants are asking me, 
what am I supposed to do? I, uh, my, my job is closed and my landlord is on my back. I heard people making statements that the landlord should, should give the tenants um, a break. Well, when you become a landlord, you, uh, when, when you become a landlord, let me see how you will do that, giving your tenant a break. It's easy for you to say that if you're a tenant, but if you're a landlord, you would understand that it's not something that you could just do because someone say you must do it. The government has a responsibility to ensure that its citizens are the territory residents are able to function. Being able to function is mean that you get it, it mean, meaning that you have access to resources. And if government has to give you a voucher to get food, if government has to give you a rent stimulus, the government has to give you a utility stimulus. That's what the government has to do. It's their responsibility. Look around the world, especially the developed world, and see how they are dealing with this pandemic as far as their citizens are concerned. So there are no two ways around it. Waiting for this thing to correct itself, by that time, you're going to have so many people who has fallen so far by the wayside. People who has, has, has yet to recover from Hurricane Irma. People are yet to recover from Hurricane Irma. I saw a young man who wrote about himself and his family. He went as far as a documented. He wrote about himself and his family, what situation they, they, they're faced with. Both him and his wife are out of work. His house got damaged with Hurricane Irma. He's yet to get that re re repaired. And the government, our government had the opportunity to tap into a, 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 a four? 400. $426 million loan guarantee. And they rolled the dice and they lost because had, it, had, had we not, if we didn't have to face this pandemic with the, with, with the COVID, we could have winged our way through with the $414 million budget that we have and wait for the next $480 million budget that we'll have next year. And, and you know, have the people just bear with us. Well, we got, uh, we had we had a crisis of Hurricane Irma backed up with this pandemic and we lost the opportunity, as far as I know, the opportunity to get that, to tap into that $426 million loan guarantee has been lost because the, the deadline was September 30th of last year. And we haven't heard anything since. The Premier had his meeting. He said that he was supposed to forward some documents to the UK and all that stuff. We don't, we in the opposition don't know what happened. So here we are. The 28th, the 28th of, of May. As far as I'm concerned, whether the Premier comes the 28th of May or the 4th of June or, or, or July 2nd or whatever the case may be, it's late. It's late. Late for our students who are at home studying and, and don't have the computers as yet. Uh, they, do they have data? I don't think they got data. That's a part of the package. If you don't have data, you can't get on. You, you can't get on the internet. Even though the, the the carriers have been kind enough to say, I think they said that if you're a student, they're not going to charge. But if you don't have a plan, you got to have a plan first in order to get in there. So we have a, we have we have work. We have a lot of work cut out for us. And it's all about the government. It's all about the government. I, I will be the first to tell you that there's, there has been no, no, no training program for this, this pandemic that we're faced with. No government has a training program for it. It's a new government. All except one member has been in government before. But the experience you gotta, you gotta learn fast. You gotta be a quick learner. And it's not that we are sitting here trying to be hard on the government or anything like that. It's just a matter that we are faced with here in the territory. Members of the opposition are being asked the same question that members in the government is being asked. And we are expected to give answers and solutions to the problems. So that's my situation right now. That's where I stand. Thank you.
afternoon to the people of the territory, um, to the media, those listening on radio station ZBVI, leader of the opposition, member for the third district. Um, I am Melvin Mitch Turnbull, representative for the second district. And I am just going to not take too much time, but just going to piggyback on some of the things both the leader of the opposition as well as the member of the third just shared. Um, and I'll, I'll do it in reverse. I'll piggyback from where the member of the third left off and then go back to where the leader of the opposition opened. Um, I, th I think it's extremely important that we understand and, uh, and appreciate where we are. This is indeed a difficult time. This is indeed a space that we have not been in before. Um, and we as the territory of the Virgin Islands have to continue to do our best to, to remain safe and to, to be our brothers and sisters keeper in, in the best interest. But one of the things that is plague in this society is the lack of information. Um, and, and it's not information Information when it's pushed down your throat is one thing. But information when it is discussed and agreed upon, not just five members sitting in cabinet and when things don't go right, they blame the governor or they blame whomever else, um, but they take credit for the things that do go right. But the people of the territory elected 13 members to the House of Assembly. Uh, nine districts and four at-large representatives. And we have, just like you have been doing in the media, um, asking for information, asking for the opportunity to have the discussions, um, not the regurgitation of information of when the pandemic started and how many cases. We see that on, on the news we, we could read just like anybody else. But having the discussions on the decisions that are made for the people of this territory um, and how it affects them, how it will, will, will transcend throughout their lifestyle and, and their livelihood. Um, the member for the third just spoke about the, the educational factor. You have students to this day. Um, I, I, like Honorable Fraser and, and Honorable, I know for sure, Honorable Penn, um, I have purchased laptops for, for students within my district, even to uh, some of the educators, the teachers will be asking for assistance with, with laptops so that they can um, be able to facilitate the training for our students. But then this is something that we're looking at outside of the fact that we were locked down for almost 30 days and then another 14 days. And now we're here, we are now. And now you are almost two weeks in with this online training, but the students and the parents and the families still don't have the resources to allow their students and their children, and one of the things in the Constitution is that no children should be disallowed the opportunity to learn. This is what we're doing. But it's all being, it's all being masked on the, the fact that a plan is coming, a plan is coming. Um, I heard an old person say one time, I'd rather you take your time and hurry up, because we were promised, what, a month ago, if not more than that, a month ago that this plan is coming, when we asked for a general meeting with the um, health emergency operating center, we were told that on a Thursday, I think the meeting was on a Tuesday, we were told on a Thursday we would get the draft of, of this economic stimulus plan. That's over a month ago. We still don't see it. And now today you see um, seven points that was just chucked together um, to say that this is, this is the response to economic plan. This is the government of the Virgin Islands that has a budget of $414 million. This is a government that has been elected to represent the people of this territory since February 19, 2019, if I got the date correct. But what I see on this paper is just a, a bunch of numbers and things that were done. Now, be it some of them are good and some of them were necessary. But if I go to number two, well, number one, because I like, I like the numbers, 
Um, the $12 million, we asked for a breakdown of how that money was spent. To this date, we have yet to hear a breakdown. We heard some of the things that were purchased for the $12 million, but we don't have the actual numeric breakdown to account for the $12 million. That's one. Then you go to number two with the food and medication and other essential services for residents and seniors. And I want us to pay attention to how these things will evolve. Because initially it was for the food, it was $2 million for food um, for seniors and the vulnerable in the territory. So notice that medication and all the other things are going to come because you're going to have to find things to, to um, add up to it. $2 million, there's no breakdown to date on that. I understand now the same uh, Honorable Premier who accused and accosted the former Premier, I remember it well because I had just got elected, the former Premier of calling an audit on himself and he said he's now willing to call an audit on himself um, to, to be accountable for the people. So that, that, is, that is one that threw me for a loop, but I, I will wait for that audit to be done. And then the free water delivery service number three for the people until June 1st, 2020. So it means that people will get monies and they will be back in the jobs by June, by the end of this month, so that they can pay their bills in June because you have a, you have a free. But the issue here is the persons that applied for water and for various reasons, weren't able to get a meter installed or get their, their connection hooked up from the water and sewage departments. You're denying them water because they don't have a meter set up or they're not in the system. So now it's left to the district representatives who continue to receive those calls. And I know I have purchased loads and loads of water so far for, for residents in, in, in my district to help them. So you're saying you're doing something, but if you dig a little bit deeper, dig a little bit deeper than the surface and all the talk and the rhetoric that we continue to hear. If we pay attention to what's going on, as Honorable Fraser said and Honorable Penn said, this is the government's responsibility. This is something that people are put in a position that they didn't ask for. It's something that they can't control and neither of us can control. But you had, the last question that we asked in the House of Assembly, you had in excess of 70 plus million dollars in your reserve. The reserve is to be able to do and, and take care of situations that are emergency in nature, unforeseen circumstances. This is where we are. So for you taking all this time to say you come with a plan and you're not going to be rushed, nobody's asking for you to be rushed. We're asking you to do something. Come up with a plan later before the people. Let us see what is involved because people are hurting every day. So the people without water, that's another thing. Funding for farmers and fisher folk to ensure employment. Um, this, I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe this plan was talked about from last year, um, in October and November last year, coming out to December, that there was going to be $2 million stimulus for fishing and farmers. Uh, but now it's part of the economic response, which is fine. However, to date, um, I am yet to hear any fisher person or farming individual or groups of individuals to benefit because what I understand was done so far was just a survey to gather information. There was nothing substantial in terms of an application process of how these people are going to receive this money. So again, these, these are just things on paper. These are just things that sound good, but people need to see and feel the benefit and the effects of these things that we're talking about. So. It's okay to say you have a plan. It's okay to say you have two million here, two million there, four million there, 12 million there. But what is the effect of it? Are we actually seeing it? Are people benefiting from it? But the more you hear and the more we receive calls um, as, as representative, you understand that there are real situations in this territory that people are failing. Number five, creating jobs. Well, I understand where number five comes from, Annabelle Fraser, creating jobs and business opportunities, because remember, they pledged a thousand jobs in a thousand days. So, you know, anything has to be to create jobs, I guess. Um, to household collection of garbage, number six, the 500 laptops for students. Now, where does this 500 laptops come from? Where did the number come from? We only have 500 students in the territory? 
or we only have, oh, because there's no poor people in the territory, I think there's only need for 500 laptops for students. But have they been purchased? Have they been disseminated? What is the criteria for persons to receive these laptops? Or we're just doing it um, however we feel. What is the plan behind this whole thing? The agreements that were made with the, with the, with the telecom providers, how is that trickling down to the families? Even the students that we have that are, don't speak, um, the English is not their first language, or even the students that were falling behind in school that needed that special attention and that after school, how are we reaching those people if they weren't learning in the school with a teacher, how are they learning now in the classroom, online? How, how is that being taken care of? Especially if you have parents that I, I saw I saw somewhere on, on, on the media where a, a lady just, a parent just said, listen, I can't read or write. So you're telling me about going online. I'm trying to give my, my child the opportunity to, to have an opportunity at education that I didn't have. Now you're telling me I have to stay home with them and, and help them do what? I can't read. Number seven, STEM duty waiver. I'm not even going to touch on that because um, for me, it's, it doesn't reach the people, the landlords, the rent. Persons still to this day calling each of us asking um, to help purchase food because they're out of work. Look at the tourism industry, and I'll, I'll, I'll slow down here to, to pause for the leader opposition to continue. But looking at the tourism industry, in the second district, you have Just Van Dyke, you have King Garden Bay, Bruce Bay, um, and the other areas within the territory that focus on tourism. What are you doing for the dishwasher, for the, for the chef? For, for the wait staff, for those people who that's their life, bread and brother, but they have rent to pay. They have bills and expenses to pay. How are they supposed to make it? And you're telling me that you're coming with a plan and coming with a plan and coming with a plan and coming with a plan. And then you, we hear the references drawn on who moved too fast and the, 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 the mistakes that they would have made. But we have had enough time. Lay out something that the people of this territory have an opportunity to decipher, well, this is how we could bend, and then make the amendments. But because there is no communication, because there is no dialogue between the government and the opposition, even some of the government and the government, then you're finding that these things are coming up haphazardly, and there's a lot of amendments. Every time you, you, you make a decision, you go out and amend it tomorrow because you didn't think of this. But the 13 of us, this is not about um, politics, this is not about um, a party, this is about the country and the people of the country and they, each person in this country put a representative, they put their names next to somebody that they want to represent them and we 30, all of us are to serve our country first, but we can't help but realizing that what we are faced with, what we are faced with in this territory is now almost where you know the government comes out they give their decision they make their comments they do whatever they, they they want to do and we're forced to accept it nobody nobody is given the opportunity to challenge it and if you happen to challenge it then you're seen as um not a love of your country and and all the other foolishness that that's coming up we have to get to the point where we understand that this pandemic situation just like the hurricanes of 27 what is an opportunity once again another opportunity for us as bbi landers as people in this territory to help build one another and we can't do it by trying to put people against each other you can't say at one time is, is bbi love or bbi whatever the catchphrase and everything that we hear now is catchphrase because it seems like a campaign the people of the virgin islands i i believe are far beyond campaign season. We're looking for governance, we're looking for leadership, and we're looking for accountability. And that's what I think we, we are expecting, and that's why we have these meetings in this opposition. As the leader started and he said, we are here because we started um, out to be accountable. We started to ensure that our voices are heard and your concerns that you relate to us on a daily basis 
uh, uh, voiced and aired, and the plan that was laid out by the leader of opposition and, and, and this team is just to say, listen, these are the things that we've been taking up. We haven't had the opportunity to share them because we're not invited to these meetings. So we're laying it out. Now you hear um, a response to it. So if that's what it takes to get things moving, then we are more than willing to do it. But we have to move beyond just the fast talk, just the rhetoric, just the catchphrases, and get things done that is going to benefit the country. You cannot be spending money on certain things, saying that you're doing it for the people of this country when it doesn't benefit them and they, they can't feel, feel the effect of it. So I'll pause there for now and hope to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, colleague. Thank you to my colleagues for their input. I think it's important that we relay the concerns that are raised by people. There's, there's a challenge. This, this COVID-19 pandemic has presented a very challenging situation for all of us at Virgin Islands and for the whole territory and the world globally. And, and it's important for us to have this dialogue with you, the public, and with the government. As, as you heard the members said, we've been trying to have this dialogue specifically on the economy because we believe it's critical. The economy's most critical point is a point that we always in the House of Assemblies, our point that we continue to hammer home, that we need to have a focus, a coherent, cohesive plan in how we're going to take the territory through this economic economically challenging situation. This is not like Hurricanes or Maria. No one is coming to our rescue. We have to figure out the way out of this, and it, we have to be very strategic, and we have to be decisive in the decision that we make moving forward as it relates to moving the territory forward and our economy forward. We relay the concerns that have been raised by many residents. People are going through some very difficult times right now. And it's important for us to make some, some decisions to assist persons to transition through those very difficult times. I mean, I heard some comments, and, and people are not, people of the Virgin Islands, are, Virgin Islanders are not um, lazy people. People want to work. There just isn't any work. People don't want to not pay their bills. People want to pay their bills. This is a situation that has been trusted upon all of us. And, and, and when you are put in a position of leadership, you have a responsibility to help your people and help the territory transition through this process. We brought forward the ideas um, from, from the people, from, from persons within the industries, the key industries. We wanted to have this conversation. And now I see that we're finally having this conversation. We've seen the government put out something. You heard my colleagues, um, and I wouldn't go over um, that. I'll, I'll have to leave some time for the media to ask their questions. But we're looking for um, something to move this economy forward, to help the struggling people, the, the, the single parents, the people in this country who have been struggling before COVID-19, or even in an even worse situation right now. Um, so we'll stop there for there. I think, we, I think we've, we've laid out a lot of the concerns that have been raised to us by the public and things that we've tried to raise internally. Uh, we'll leave the floor open for the media um, to ask any particular questions you might have and we'll do our best to answer all your questions in a respectful manner. Okay, good, up. good afternoon, everyone. Kamal here from BVA News. Um, the first question is directed um, to the entire opposition. On March 24, the Premier and Mr. Penn would have stated that party politics would have been set aside to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. And recently, we would have seen a proposed economic stimulus plan, plan from the opposition. Have there been any discussions with the Premier or members of the government regarding this proposed economic stimulus plan? Yeah. Yes, on, on the 24th, I did stand along with the Premier, and we've pledged to work with the Premier to move the territory forward as it relates to this COVID-19 pandemic and all the related issues. As you heard my colleagues mention, on several occasions, we've been trying, we've been agitating to have a conversation related to the economic stimulus and the issue of economics um, surrounding the COVID-19. To date, we've yet to have such a conversation with the Premier. You heard a member for the second mention that we were promised after a meeting in last month to have a discussion on the draft plan from the government, which, was not, which didn't happen. Um, we subsequently asked, the member for the third have asked that we have a meeting again. I've, I've also asked on several occasions when we've had discussions to discuss the economy. That hasn't happened. We as an opposition, uh, have a responsibility. And one of the things that I said uh, to the Premier at that press conference, I don't know if you remember, 
that I will do my job. I will keep him honest when he needs to be kept honest. I have a statutory responsibility, and all of us in opposition, to represent the people of this territory and their interests. And for us, this is a very critical juncture where the people need representation as it relates to the economy and moving the economy forward. You have people in the tourism industry who have been out of a job for over two months. The tourism industry literally has been shut down across um, the sister islands, who, who many of them, that is their main and only industry. The restaurants have been closed. The bars can't open. So there's no economic activity happening in Nanigata, for the most part, or any of the other sister islands. So you need to, we need, we cannot continue to play this wait and see game. We have a responsibility, we have a voice. We have to make sure we make that voice loud. We tried our best. We tried privately to have those conversations. It wasn't forthcoming, and we thought it was necessary for us to, to come to the public, make the necessary um, plans. We continue to be, 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 whenever we question things in the house, we're being questioned that we need to bring, well, bring your solutions, bring your plans, and we've done that. We brought the ideas forward, and we're hoping now that, that we're seeing the dialogue happening now. We're seeing that, that the people are, are, are being heard, the concerns, people are stepping forward. They're, they're not afraid anymore. Say, so, look, I am experiencing this. I'm, I'm glad that you did this because we've been, we've been hurting. Our business is, 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 is failing. We need some support. We need some guidance on where's the next step. What's the next step for the economy from, from a tourism point of view? How is financial services performing? You know, those are, those are questions that we need to have a public discussion on in terms of a country moving forward. So, so we've started a discussion. If anything has happened out of this, is that we've got the, the conversation that we've been asking for for the last two months. The conversation has started. People of this territory are involved in that conversation, and, and I'm hopeful that to, to see something come. As a, as a member for the third saying, it's, it's, it's late. But it better late than never, because we need to move the country forward. We, we as the 13 leaders of this country, have a responsibility to the people of this country to ensure that we protect their livelihood, protect the economy that they're so dependent, they're so dependent on. So we, we tried our best. We've done our part. And I think we've, we've been responsible in our activities as opposition. We, we, we never, during the last two plus months during the process, we allowed the government to lead. We allowed the government to do the things that they needed to do to keep this territory safe. We've made suggestions where we needed to make suggestions. Even sometimes our suggestions weren't taken, it's fine. That's what a democracy is. But we've, we, we have brought forward suggestions to move the country forward, to keep us safe as well. So we've done our part. And I think we're at a junction now where we need to do more. And that's why we're here today. Well, well, that process could be handled in the House of Assembly. We, we intend to, and I think we, we all are on the same page. We've asked, you know, in formal meetings that we've had so far, um, that it's important for us to get the information specific to how specifically the $12 million was spent and, or, or is being spent. Um, the Premier himself made a public um, declaration that he's going to bring that information forward. He's going to make sure that he's transparent. He's going to police himself so that no one has to police him. So we're hopeful that it's forthcoming. Um, we are both in the process of getting the Public Accounts Committee restarted. Um, we, we expect to have a meeting next week to continue the work that we started prior to COVID-19. As you know, we had the challenges with COVID-19 and the issues with social distancing, but we're, we're committed to continue our, our, our work because we have a lot of work to do, not just specifically to the things surrounding COVID-19, but in general, just in, in, in looking at the, the finances of the territory and the finances of the government. And we, we intend to, to uphold our constitutional um, responsibility as it relates to the, the PSC. So we, we will continue to do our part. Um, we will agitate once there's house meetings, ask the questions, to ensure that the public has the, has the information, it's public information. We've had the challenges, as I've, I've expressed here in, in press conferences before, where we've asked questions and we're still yet to get the information, specifically to a lot of things that has happened recently. 
um, and we will bring those things public again um, in terms of making sure that the, the information that's necessary comes to you, the public. Because it's your, it's, your, it's your information, it's your business. And we need to ensure that the business of the public is dealt with uh, in, a, in a transparent and prudent way. Good afternoon. Zandro Wisk, Zadibay Radio. Good afternoon. The effects of COVID-19 would have started around February, now is um, May. The Premier is saying that he will not be rushed into coming up with a stimulus package. He hasn't said who's rushing him, but he said he will not be rushed. Mr. Fraser and um, Mr. Turnbull spoke in length about um, what the government has outlined in relation to like $800,000 went to garbage and free water and so on. Are uh, you saying, Mr. Fraser and Mr. Turnbull, that the money is not being trickled down to the persons who are facing everyday hardships, not getting money to go on their everyday duties? Are you saying, sir, that it has its priorities wrong at this time? It's, it's, to me, it's not a matter of having your priorities wrong. I'm not knocking the government for doing the things that, that are outlined here. But to, to, to publish this as a stimulus, well, it's, it's labeled a stimulus response. Uh, maybe the only thing I can knock the government for right now is for not delivering on a stimulus package. But as far as this that I'm looking at is concerned, to me, has no relevance as far as stimulus is concerned. Like I, start, I talk about the garbage collection. Substituting house-to-house -house collection for bin collection, that's a trade-off. That's, that's not a new initiative. So that's what I'm asking you, the government, because you made mention that government has it all wrong. You said that earlier. So in relation to the $800,000 is going to garbage collection, it should not be there. So are you saying, as a result of that, that the government has its priorities wrong? The money should have been there to trickle down to the, every, to the person who's been hurt every day? This particular item is not new money. This is money that was being spent to pick up garbage anyway. I'm saying that the government has not addressed the issue of stimulus for the country, its people, and the economy. That has not been addressed, not by what I'm looking at here. There's nothing here that addressed that issue of stimulus. You outlined the whole issue of repatriation. A question was put to the Premier at the last press conference if he is looking at repatriating persons, his own people from abroad, as what is being done in other Caribbean countries, you would have outlined what is being also done in those international countries. He said he's not looking at, it's not yes or no, while he's looking at it at this time, because he outlined that, that the people in the Virgin Islands would have done a good job so far, um, being in-house and content with the government in containing the virus. And one has to be careful about those people who are coming in, right, where they may um, bring more risk and bring risk to the people who are already here have done a good job. So are you saying then, sir, what, what are you calling on the government to do at this time as a matter of urgency? Uh, in, in addition to the stimulus that I'm talking about, that I spoke about, that people need, people need a stimulus as far as whether it's a voucher to buy, to purchase food, or it's rent, subsidies, monies to spend. People has obligations, whether it's people overseas, the kids overseas in schools that they have to, they have to um, uh, finance. Those kids that are overseas at school, they probably got apartments, the, whatever their expenditures are, somebody has to pay for it. And if that somebody is someone here in the territory, that person in the territory doesn't have the money. The government has to find that money for them. This is what's happening around the world. This is nothing new. So those are the things that I'm talking about. As far as the people coming back home, it's not rocket science. If those people are required to go into quarantine, then bring them and put them in the quarantine. Leaving them out there hanging is unconscionable. It's wrong. They should be back home. A citizen of a country has nowhere else to go but home. And it is high time that they come home. We've been talking about this now since January, February, March, April, May. We're almost finished with May right now, and they're still out there. These are people who I said 
left the territory for things that the country, this territory doesn't provide for them. They had to go for medical treatment. And while they're being treated, left here for three days, and while they're being treated, the borders close. So what am I supposed to do? Can you imagine? Can you imagine leaving home and going overseas and can't come back home? Not to mention the many things that you left here that are requiring your attention. No government should be allowed to get away with this. Not definitely not for this long. And if it's a quarantine that they need to be going that they need to go into for two weeks when they get back home, it's all responsibility to provide those facilities. But a citizen has a right to come home at any given time. And don't tell me because it's 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 this, this the disease, you had ample time to deal with it. Like I said, since January 30th, the Minister for Health outlined all the parameters and all the things that will be done in order to accommodate the e uh, unfortunate eventuality that this disease comes to the territory. That's a long time ago. And I feel the pain of those people. If I leave, if I leave the Virgin Islands right now, I would have left my pet. I can't, I I can't uh, expect someone to take care of my pet who I asked to just do me a favor for two days while I'm away. And there are those who has their elderly parents who may have left and can't get back home. What do you do? This is not uh, government. When when you get when you ask the people of a territory to elect you, and you become so fortunate to be the government, that's a huge responsibility, and it includes everything when it comes to taking care of your people. If if I may if I may also um, piggyback on that question, um, I, I think. It's equally important to, to consider, again, I keep saying the effect that is having on, on parsing. But the priorities seem to be all over the place. Because you know for a fact it, it, is, not, it is not something that you have to go investigate people are without their jobs. They're without money. They're without means to pay their bills. They're without means to, to, to take care of themselves with the food and, and the different things that they need. But then in this same vein, we pass a law that adds on a 7% tax to persons sending money overseas. And claims say that they don't have no poor people in this territory because you saw a couple of members of the House Assembly send the money. How is that a priority when people are hurting and the very fabric of this British Virgin Islands territory is our forefathers going to Cuba and Dominican Republic and all over the different place to provide and send money back for, for their families who were there. And now you put this tax on them in this unprecedented economic crisis. And then top it up to say that you're doing it to provide for farming and the seniors and the this and that. But each one of those ministers and ministries have about 30 or $40 million that's budgeted. And you're fighting over a million dollars on the backs of the working class. And then we have the heart to talk about God and what God going to do and what God ain't going to do. God is not a God of confusion. He's not a God of disorder. If we're going to do it, we need to prioritize and deal with the people of this territory. Honorable Fraser is making a point of, of people coming back home, and he has a valid point. And I'm on the point of people who are here, the people who are here suffering and struggling daily, wanting to know what is going to happen? How are we going to make it to tomorrow? And you have a government and a leadership of this country continuing to either play the blame game or cast blame or criticize any single thing that or anyone that opposes their view and vision. And even when we in the opposition, who are elected by the people, come up with ideas. They're not taking advice. They're not taking this. They're not going to be rushed. But this is all our responsibility to lead the country. So are you running a campaign or are you running the country? 
And if you're going to run a country, let's put the people of the country and their needs first. And right now, you have a hurting people. And I learned this a long time ago. Hurting people hurt people. I'm not encouraging anything, but what do you do when your back is against the wall? And you're reaching out and trying to find different ways and means to do this and that. And there's nothing coming except a promise. But then you see contracts signing and contracts signing and contracts signing. And some of these contracts weren't even budgeted. But I'll stop there. The, the whole issue of the COVID, you made mention about the persons are hurting, the, the financial industry, the tourism industry. Mr. Fraser, you spoke about the COVID has been dragged on. You think the, this needs to stop and open up the economy and let people work? You think we need to stop this for a I can say I can say that from where I sit because the, the, the essence behind curfew, the spirit behind the curfew, it all generated within the Constitution dealing with state of emergency. The only time you were able to impose a curfew on the people was during a state of emergency. And if you go to the Constitution and you see the conditions under which a, 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 a curfew is imposed, it tells you that it can only be done for a specific period once, and you must go back to the House of Assembly in order to extend it. I'm a member of the House of Assembly. This particular curfew is under the Act, the, the Disease Endemic Act, and it's not under a state of emergency. And if you've been watching, we haven't had an opportunity to discuss, debate, the, the, the circumstances under which the curfew is being imposed, whether it is valid, has all the circumstances been vetted under which a curfew is imposed, has everything been taken into con under consideration. So you got one curfew after another, after another, after another, and it hasn't come to the House of Assembly for us to debate. So I can sit here and say to you, it's been dragged on and on and on. And I don't know if these many reasons that are given are indeed valid. Because as far as I know, they haven't been debated. I don't know if they were properly vetted. Have we taken into consideration the, the, the medical risk as opposed to the economic risk? And weigh that and see which is the most critical for us at this particular time. So I can say that from where I sit. As far as I know, as far as I can see, it is high time that we get this economy going again. You know, you talk about, oh, you can open the clothing stores, you can open the, 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 the beauty salons and all the rest of it. But opening a clothing store and the guy at who, who has a restaurant doesn't have customers mean he's not making money. So he can't come to the clothing store to shop. The store is open, yes. You wait until the first week is passed, and, those cl and the, the, the store owners realize that I didn't make any money to pay the clerks. You see, you see, you'll see what happened then. And that's exactly what's going to happen. The economy needs to be reopened. And you can't reopen the economy with coffee under coffee conditions. There's a reason for having the, the, the lockdown for 14 days. And if that reason is valid, then we already had the 14 day lockdown plus the seven plus another seven. And I wanted to go back to one thing that you asked regarding allowing people to come back in and the reason they talk about not letting them back in is because they will contaminate the folks that are here or something to that effect. But did you ever stop and think about all the freight that's coming in, all these boxes that's coming in. They, they, tell you, they ask you to wipe surfaces. The reason they ask you to wipe surfaces is because that, that thing, the virus, lives on surfaces. All these boxes that are coming in daily, who's wiping those? You know, we had these, these, these frogs around the place. Where those frogs came from? They came from overseas in crates and all the rest of it, and sand that came from all over. So let's be real. This virus that we're talking about, we can talk about it for years. 
and we will. But I think that enough is enough. And stop using excuses to hide behind. Let's get real and do what's needed. To be honest with you, I, I don't know what the government is thinking. I <laughs> this is something that I have to say. And and it may be taken it, it might be taken the wrong way. But as far as I see it, I think the premier is overtaxed. It's and anyone who has eyes to see can see. He is, he is really overtaxed. Meaning that he has a lot of weight to carry around. A lot on his shoulders. And he needs more eyes. The question you ask as to whether or not, whether or not they can't see how they're going to regenerate whatever revenues that they might be spending, that not whatever monies they might spend, why they're being reluctant. I don't, think, I don't think that's what it is. I don't think that's what it is. I just think that the burden is a little too heavy. The, the member for the second district said it's 70, 70 million dollars, 75 million dollars was the last figure I heard about the reserve. And that's the best point for the premier to start with right now. Well, not right now, he should have started three, four months ago. But the reserve, the reserve is there for a purpose. It is for crises like this. We didn't touch it. Basically, we didn't touch it after Irma. And that's, that's another, that's, that's something else I was criticizing the last government for as well. I don't understand the reluctance to touch the reserve. Prior to 2012, we did not have a reserve fund. There was a reserve, but there was not a reserve fund. The reserve was considered any monies that government had that was unencumbered. Any monies. That means it, whatever money was in the consolidated fund, the um, name all the funds that government has. And all the funds was considered our reserve. 2012. April 23rd, 2012, with the, the, the um, inception of the, the new Bowen guidelines, we were asked to ha establish a fund called the Reserve Fund, and that, and that was a fund that's separate. So we started raising money and putting it in that fund up to $75 million. So it's not as if when you use the 70 out of the $75 million, you're depleting government's monies. Government will still have its consolidated fund. It will still have its pension fund. It will still have its disaster fund and all the other funds. And that's what that money is for. People in this territory should not be guessing right now when they go to bed tonight what's to what tomorrow is going to hold. They should have had this stimulus available to them already, knowing exactly, well, every, every two weeks I'll go and I'll collect X amount of dollars. And I believe one of the things, is one of the things that we're faced with is that there is no, cri no criteria in the country 
for determining the needs of individuals. We haven't established an a, a, a unemployment compensation fund. Had we had that in place, we would have known what your situation is, what your situation, what the other person's situation is. Knowing you just can't walk up and say, well, I need money. Well, who are you? Where are you in the system? How much did you pay in? Where is you, do you have a regular income? If you never had a regular income, then you're not losing anything due to COVID-19 because you never had an income, so you, can't, you didn't lose anything. So those are the problems, the pitfalls that we are in. And those are some of the reasons that people put themselves up for public office specifically to run the country. You should see these things and get the proper mechanisms in place for when a disaster like this hits, you'll be prepared. No, I, I, I think I, I, I support the comments made by my honorable colleague. I think the reality is is that we had time to, to, to prepare out the plan. This is not like a hurricane when you don't know when a hurricane will hit. We knew from December thereabouts that COVID-19 is real and it's going to happen. The government had enough time to plan and prepare to make things happen. I can't say that it's a financial issue because you heard about, we asked a question in Alba House in terms of the financial resources. I think the last uh, number in terms of monies on account was over $120 million available in the government coffers. You have a starting point, a plan, and figure out how you're going to assist your, your people in during this very difficult time. If you're going to, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. If we're going to close tourism, we know that we're going to put a lot of people out of work. We're going to put a lot of businesses out of our income. So we have to figure out what's the opportunity cost and the loss there. Yes, we and, 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 we're, and we're not in any way saying that we don't have to keep people safe. We, we supported all the plans to keep persons in this territory safe. But the reality is, is that we have to learn to coexist with COVID-19 and coexist safely. Because if every time that there's a fear that somebody would get ill and we shut down the entire place, this could be going on for the next three to four years. So we have to figure out how, what are the best safety protocols coupled with open back up in the economy to ensure that economic activity continues to happen. We see all around the region, countries are doing that. They are putting the steps in place to ensure they keep their, pe their, their, their citizens safe, they keep their visitors safe, and they ensure that the economy continues to move. Nobody wants to get sick. But life has to move on. And I think, I think we, we cannot speak to why the government hasn't done what it's done. I don't know if it's, they, it's, they, 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 don't, they don't know how or what, what the next steps are. But that is why we ask that all of us, all 13 of us, sit down, bring our ideas, let's discuss this, let's figure it out. This is not politics. We are here because we know people are hurting. We get the calls every day. We see the businesses, the business owners, they tell us, look, we, we, what are we doing? What are you guys doing? We don't know what next, where, where to turn, what's the next step. Families who don't have, have food. I, I mean, every day I know members here in this opposition, I know members in the government take food to families who are, who are struggling. It's a difficult time and we need to move. The time to move is now. We don't know why, reason why they haven't moved for the last two plus months, but we're glad that we're having a conversation now because the ultimate goal is to ensure the people of this territory get some kind of, of recourse in the, during this very difficult time. Okay, um, back on the $70 million that is in the reserve, um, if we could look at that figure, uh, we would know for a fact that that is a drip in the bucket in terms of if you are to help your people to a certain level, uh, be able to give a package to small, medium businesses to get themselves back on, the, on their feet give a certain amount of uh, monies to, to the unemployed to ensure that they're able to feed their families for two, three, four months. Uh, if it is that the government is looking at not necessarily wanting to completely deplete that reserve fund, what other avenues are there now for the government to explore the possibilities of getting fundings, grants, that can aid the territory, given also again the fact that according to Honorable 
Fraser, they have lost the opportunity as the loan guarantee. Well, well, we raised some uh, opportunities through the Social Security Board and, and the, the, the possibility of, you heard Armour Fraser just raised the point, of we should have had unemployment insurance and some kind of unemployment scheme to help persons during this process. But we don't, the reality is that we don't know what is the, the actual situation now financially with the government's account. We haven't had that information come forward. We're hearing um, specific um, um, information that financial services continues to do well, but we don't have anything solid to, to, to really back that up. We're suggesting at multiple ways in which you could look at whether you, you tap into your resources externally. I know that the, the government has been talking about working with the UK. And at the end of the day, the UK themselves needs help, they need support. Um, they themselves are going through this. This is a global issue. But we have the resources enough to start the process. See, the problem is that we've not had an open discussion to date until now on where we are financially. The, we only had the last set of information since the house shut down and um, in, I think it's February, we got that end of January, we got the last financial information. So we have access to Social Security and, and, and we recommended programs through Social Security that could, could, we could recoup at, at a later stage to, to fund some of the unemployment issues that we're having. Um, there, as I said, last time is $120 million in terms of unaccount by government available funds. We have to figure out, we have to start the process. Um, at the end of the day, we haven't seen any action, we haven't heard any discussion in terms of where they are as it relates to that. And we are still waiting to have that comprehensive conversation. So we've started a conversation. Um, the issue of funding is, 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 is one that we all have to, to look at. And, and there are avenues in which we could get funding done. The government has, has leverage now for borrowing. I don't know if borrowing is available. Uh, we haven't had any updates in terms of the member was very, very clear of the opportunity with the 400 and something million dollar loan. I'm happy to see the projects moving right now as it relates. And those are projects, for the most part, that was approved in 2018. So there's nothing new that the government is doing right now economically. Those are projects that were approved under the last administration through the CDB $65 million loan. And those are things that, that I am happy that is continuing. But we need to do more. And I think the government has the, the fiscal room to do more right now. But there's no communication. There's no dialogue. So, so we are now just, if for us to say anything specific, we are making assumptions. And that's not the, that's not the right thing to do. Um, complaints, if I start on the complaints, I, I think sometimes we complain for the sake of complaining, but the, the validity of the genuine concerns, I think, is more than a complaint. That, that I've been hearing is, is the things that I've shared with you. Um, I don't have nothing else to eat. I don't have no resources. Um, there's, there's no money coming in. We've been laid off work. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, and nobody's hiring. So what do we do? And it, it's, left to, it's left to us. Um, to find ways to, to help the people within our, within our territory, not just the district. Because for me, while I have the responsibility for the people in the district, I think we all have a, a, a bigger responsibility, a larger responsibility to people in the territory. So um, you communicate with the, with the different agencies through social development and, and the likes of them. And they're saying, listen, we're strapped. We, we, don't, have, we, don't, have any, we don't have any more resources. And this cry is happening throughout the territory, especially on Just Van Dyke. And 
and he got an unfortunate and got an even here in Tortola. So the problems and, and, and the concerns, I won't call them complaints, they're actually very real. Businesses having to open, especially for the restaurants. Let's think logically for a second. You have restaurants open um, to do takeouts only. What people have been locked down for 30 days. You've seen them on, on, on social media. How many people stayed home and actually cooked and enjoyed cooking, whether it tasted good or not. That's another thing. But now to have restaurants open, the, the cost that it would have to prepare a meal, to take away, if people not sitting down to charge them the gratuity, how am I making my ends meet? How am I be able to pay my rent if I'm leasing or renting a property from, from the landlord? Because technically you're open and operating business. But if I'm not making it, then do I close my business and, and fold up my arms? But that's where I think the all three of us are saying it is the governmental responsibility to come in now and step in and say, listen, we, we know what's going on. We see what's going on. We feel what's going on. We've been hearing you what's going on. This is the plan that we, that we, that we are proposing or we're putting in place to help you deal with some of the, the, issues, the issues that you have, especially looking at the children in, in the community and our seniors within our community. Because on top of them being lonely, now they're lonely and hungry. And, and, and there's, no way, there's no way for them to see the future. Yes, you want to give them hope, but <laughs> prayer without walks. You can pray and pray and pray. Prayer without walks is dead. It's not faith. You talk about faith, show me your works. Show me the things that you have done for me. Then I can look at your faith. And, and we have to stop using... God's word for our own agenda or interpret it in a way that benefits us. If you're going to say that you're concerned about the people, show me. Because I don't care how much you tell me you care. Show me. Until you show me, then you're just talking. And it's just a bunch of lunch, uh, catchphrases and punchlines. Like it's a campaign, but campaigning done. It's time to govern, it's time to administrate, it's time to lead the country. You asked what are some of the concerns that are being raised in the community, in my community. I would have someone call me or send me a message telling me that they don't have food in their house. And this is after the government, government's food program. This is, I'm talking about now. And they have X amount of children. They don't have diapers for them. They don't have the, the formulas. And this is after the government program. And the supermarkets are open, yes. But they don't have the money. I'd have someone telling me about look my landlord has been back to me again asking me about the rent I told him that my job is shut down they're preparing the place for us to get back to get started back to work again but what kind of industry are you in you're in the hospitality industry and that's that's totally dependent on tourism which is where is tourism so what are you, what's the likelihood that you would ever have money to pay your landlord for the rent by working? It's highly unlikely. And that's, that's a call to government for the reality, wake up to the reality of what's taking place in the territory. Someone else would say to me, I was listening to the radio and I heard someone raise the issue about landlords giving tenants a break. I hope no one comes to me and tell me they want a break because I need my money. These are the things that you hear. And I, could only, I know it's only going to get worse. So the best thing that could happen is that we, 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 we nail it now. We should have nailed it already. But as, the, the more this thing drags on, the worse it's going to become. 
It's not like having a, a bruise on your shin or your shoulder and it's going to get healed over time. This is a wound that's going to get worse if you don't address it and address it now. So I'm, I, what I'm talking about, you, you can see what's going to happen down the road. You know what's happening right now. What's happening right now is real. And down the road, it's going to get even worse. So that's why we're sounding the alarm. No other reason. I, I, now just to, to reinforce what my colleague said, those, those are the issues. I mean, those are the issues across the spectrum throughout this territory. And, and, and to add to that, the businesses, that's, that's just from the employee's point of view. The businesses are the ones that are feeling the pinch as well. The businesses, the, the, the landlords, we talk about the tenant, but a lot of, lot of the, the landlords depend on the rent for their survival. So the landlords don't have the rent from the tenant. How can they survive and move forward? These are real issues. These are real issues that all our people are facing. So we have to find a balance. And there's an issue about funding, but we have, we have, we have to start. We had the same concern after Hurricane Zoom and Maria. We had over three point something billion dollars in damages. We didn't have that in the reserves. We didn't have that in any, any of our funds. But we moved. We started the process to get the country back on track. We started the process of getting the economy back open. Well, there's a difference in terms of this pandemic. We have to be able to, as I keep on saying, learn to coexist with COVID-19 and our economy. We have to find the right protocols to ensure that we could keep our visitors safe and keep our, 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 our residents safe. You can't, you, you can't say it can't happen, because if that's the case, we should all just pack up shop and just surrender, because that, that can't be our reality. So, so we're sounding the alarm, as a, as a member for the third said, because we understand it's important for us to preserve some remnants of the livelihood of, us, of our citizens and our residents, to preserve our economy that took over decades to build, our forefathers sweat and toil to build many of these businesses. Some of these businesses are 60 years old. We can't afford to see these businesses disappear. We have to find a way to preserve um, the livelihood of, of our citizens and, 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 and our, our residents who have come to live amongst us, who've contributed to the economy, who've played their role to keep the economy going as well. We have a responsibility. The government has a responsibility. And we, have not, we are not upscaling our responsibility. That's why you see we brought ideas forward. How we know we have a responsibility for the people of this territory who we represent as well. So we played our part. I said the, the conversation is there, um, and then we're ready to move forward and continue the conversation to ensure that we have some tangible, tangible things in place for the people of this territory. We'll ask, we'll allow two more questions, and I think we'll, we'll wrap up after that. Okay, I just have one. I have one more question. Yeah, two others. What, what, what essentially what we mean is that at some point, we have to start the process of having our economy reopen. Tourism is the next major economic pillar of this territory. It, by far, it represents most of the business activity in the territory. It represents the most employment in the territory. So it's incumbent on us to find the right balance to ensure that tourism restarts in a safe way for people and the residents of this territory. So what we're proposing that we put the protocols in place and, and put them in place during the slow season. What that does, it gives us a time to test them during the process. You don't want to put them in place when you have 50,000 persons coming at the same time and everything up at the same time. So you have an opportunity now, while things are slow, to test whatever protocols that you will put in place to keep your residents safe, but also to get businesses going again. Because as I said, the tourism industry, you heard the member for the second, um, elaborated a lot on that because his district in particular is heavily hit by this. We started a, the process where you have, you have the, the, the people who work in the restaurants, they don't survive off of their salary. It's their gratuity. 
that's gone now because all we have now is steak house. You have persons who, who walk in on the beaches, who maintain um, all the other elements of, of, of the, the industry. All of these people are unemployed. I saw some numbers of around 1,300. I know that's, that's, that's a drop in the bucket in comparison to the real numbers in terms of unemployment from this industry because the entire industry is, is closed. So we have to figure out a way to safely reopen, back up, reopen tourism. We have to ensure that the safety protocols are in place. And we have an opportunity now, while things are slow, to test those protocols. There are persons who, who are on a higher level of the income bracket who come to the BVI. The BVI Park is typically a high income um, on destination where persons who have money could, could come in and they're not easily affected by um, pandemics or disasters. And we saw that after, after Hurricane Zoma and Maria. They came. They came because they wanted to make sure that they continue to help us rebuild and, and contribute to our economy. They came and, and, and st they stayed on boats where they don't, wouldn't traditionally stay because they, 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 Biva is part of them. And, and, and we have that, that ability to, and, and th those of us who come to the Biva year after year after year after year. So we have, a, we have some unique opportunities to, to get our tourism going again. And I think we need to do it now while things are slow to really test the process and make sure that we could keep our people safe and also keep our visitors safe when they come in and get some activity going in the economy. We, 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 we made a pledge, we made a, a commitment that we would work with the government um, to, to work to help to organize and get the things moving to keep the country safe. We're a man of honor and integrity. If we give you a word, our word is our word. And we are at the point, we are at the point right now where we believe that we cannot no longer operate under the, 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 the framework that we were operating. We, we've been asking time after time specifically what is happening with the economy. How are we, what are we, how many are we want to sit down and have a proper discussion on moving the economy forward? And, and those, those conversations weren't forthcoming. We heard the cries and concerns of our, of our citizens and our residents. They're hurting. The, 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 I mean, I, heard, I know everyone in this room heard those things as well. It's real. The, the, the economic follow from COVID-19 is real. So there needs to be a response. Every action requires an equal and opposite reaction. And we have a statutory responsibility as the opposition myself as the opposition and my colleagues, to do what is in the best interest of the people at all times. And one of the things that I said to the Premier, and I'll repeat this again, that I will debat, we will work with you and help us move this through this process. But if things, uh, we see that things are not moving in the best interest of the people, we will speak. We will make sure that we say what we have to do, say, say to move this country, this economy forward, and we've done that. So we're here now, and, and we're gonna continue to keep our, our monthly discussions. And we are still open to have the dialogue with the government to move this country forward as, as is our responsibility as representatives. Thank you. Um, thank you for also We we started this 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 is a culmination of a lot of discussion that we've been having as an opposition and discussion that we've been having publicly. Um, with, with persons within the various industries who have reached out to us and, and have had grave concern about the direction of things and where the direction that we've been, we were going and, and they have recommended the proposed ideas. These are not new ideas, these are not original thoughts of ours. These are ideas that are made up from the people of this territory and people in the industries who are, who are deeply concerned about the direction of the country. Um, we really ramped up our effort recently because we saw that we weren't getting anywhere with a discussion on economic um, stimulus from the government. And we thought it was important for us to put something out there in the public to get this discussion that we're having now. You know, you're now seeing a frenzy of, of discussion about the economy. Do you see, we, we saw the, the, what was it, the response. You saw the economic response coming out now. You know, here persons within the business community that are talking about it now. That's what we want. We want to make sure that we have something and bring some support to the people of this territory. So now I think we 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 we'll be able to achieve that conversation and to really move the economy forward. I hope that we make some some decision quickly. We've lost some time, 
you know, I'm among the, the, the hopeless optimists to believe that, that we still have, have time to do what's best for our people. And I'm hoping that we, could, we, don't, we don't lose any more time and do the things that are necessary to move our country and our people forward and help them through this very difficult time um, that all of us are experiencing. Last question. Much talk has been said about the reserves and to utilize the monies and reserves to help in this situation. Using reserves, or does the protocol um, allow you to use monies from the reserves? Uh, by, um, can you spend on the reserves without violating the protocols? You go, you go, I'll go after you. The, the protocols are already violated. We start out violating them, exactly. we continue to violate them. The, 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 question, the question you're asking, can we use the reserve? Of course. That's, that's what it's for. That's whole point. You're going to hear, hear all kind of talk on the street about the UK this and the UK that. It's not true. We are a sovereign government. We have internal self-government. It's a partnership with the United Kingdom. And the protocols are an integral part of that partnership. So the, the, uh, we've, we've used the reserve after Hurricane after Hurricane Irma. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what the, what the situation is, why, why people consider it to be some sacred, sacred cow. I, I just to, just to add, I mean, you, you direct the question. I, mean, I think my colleague answered the, 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 the question very accurately. The re that's the whole point of the reserves, for disaster and unforeseen circumstances. I mean, we, we have to use it wisely. No one is going to say, let's just spend off all your money. And that's why a plan is so critical. Once you have a proper plan that has done the proper analysis and gone through the process, you know how to tweak and, and when you need to make adjustment. It has to be a living document, but you have to have one. You can't just take $12 million here and, and drop it over there, take $2 million here, drop it over there, and there's no correlation in terms of what you're doing to stimulate um, workers and families and what you're doing to, to move the economy at the same point. They both have to work hand in hand. They have to coincide. You can't be doing, the left hand can't know what, it has to know what the right hand is doing. And right now we see a, a, a sort of a dysfunctional approach to the economic recovery. There's no cohesiveness to the things that are being proposed, the things that are being implemented as it relates to the economic recovery. And, and that is what is critical. The protocol is one avenue. Um, and, and, and I pray to God that we've not lost the opportunity for the $400 million borrowing that was there for, for hurricanes um, or my Maria. Because we need to have, um, not that we're going to spend $400 million, we need, to have the we need to be able to leverage these type of things. Because you never know what's going to happen in your country. And, and COVID-19 taught us that. We, I thought we learned from hurricanes on my Maria. We wasted and we squandered that opportunity. And we might lose that opportunity, mm -hmm. and I hope to God that we haven't, because the people of this country might need some kind of, 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 of facility to assist us as we transition back into um, our regular economic activity in the country. Or else, God will have to see for all of us. We have to do something. I just want to add something to this whole thing about when, it, when I'm looking at <coughs> economic stimulus, this $12 million and this $2 million, this $12 million to purchase testing kits, respirators, medical supplies, reconstruct a, a prepare quarantine space, that $12 million was not budgeted for. That has to be a reallocation. Exactly. So if you're taking money that were budgeted for something else and reallocated to do something else, that's not a stimulus. So the appropriate place to have gotten the money from was the reserve. Then you stimulate the economy because you're putting, more, you're putting additional money. money into the economy. So I, I don't know what, what economic prudence they use to come up with such a, 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 an idea, but this is not a stimulus. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I, I want to... Thank you. I, I don't know if he's still live on ZBVI, um, I just, but I just want to thank all persons who, who were listening live at ZBVI on um, the media. I want to thank you as well as for, for, um, for your in-depth questions. You see, we gave you 
opportunity to ask as many questions as you as you had to ask. So that we're open, transparent. You can be private and public, and we believe that we must always be transparent when you're doing people's work. Um, before we leave, I'll allow my colleagues to uh, two a couple of minutes to wrap up each of them, and then I'll say my final words. Well, I too want to thank the media, the listening community of this territory of the British Virgin Islands um, as we traverse this difficult road, but it's a road that we can and will get by once we stick together, once we continue to look up to the hills from whence our help come in. Um, but we also have to not just have itching ears, but listen in depthly, listen intently to what is being said and let the actions of what is being said reflect to the point that we are all feeling that we are all able to see what is being done with the monies that is 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 supposed to help us get through these difficult times. Um, we have a role to play in the opposition. Um, I, those who know me know I am not and never will be scared to say what I must say, especially um, for the people of this territory. So we we have our role to play. I have my role to play. and. More importantly, the people of the territory are looking for, for leadership beyond um, a new case and, and, and a new illness, but looking for leadership to get them to this difficult time and, and not just somebody speaking at them, at them, at them, at them, or dictating to them um, what is going to happen or what can happen. We are looking for a solution that we can work through that we continue the rebuilding process of, of this British Virgin Islands territory um, from the hurricanes and now even through COVID-19. Our children need our help, our seniors need our help, we all need each other's help. And the only how to be done is not just saying that we're in it together, but actually making it evidence that the 13 elected members sit, discuss ideas, um, ideas are respected, and then we come out to the people with a plan and not just being done in cabinet because cabinet seems like it's taking on a persona um, that's larger than life. And then when things go wrong, you hear, well, that's not my, that's not my decision. That was the governor and that was this person or you blame whomever. We all stand here willing and ready to do what is necessary um, to assist persons in our territory, but there is an elected government that has the overall responsibility, and we're asking that the 13 of us be given the opportunity to sit down, discuss the ideas, and lay out a plan that can touch each and every individual that's hurting and going through this, this difficult time in our territory. I, I will not wave, I will not cower, um, I will not back down for the interests of the people of this territory because we all have our families, we all have our concerns, we all have our issues, but at the end of the day, this land that we have the opportunity to serve in, we have the ability to serve in the best interest of the people, for the people, and with God's help. So. Don't just have itching ears to listen to catchphrases. Pay attention to what's going on, and we will ensure here in the opposition that we are keeping things on the up and up. Thank you. I want to express my gratitude to the media for being able to join us and to have our views taken to the public in a way that they can compare what the opposition has to offer with that of the government. As you can see, the, the opposition has put out a plan before you and there's more to come. Uh, should I say further elucidation of the plan to come. 
I want to commend the folks, my constituents of the third district, for what I have considered to be good stewardship as citizens of the territory and conducting themselves in a way that I am proud of during this critical time of COVID-19. It's not by any way, any means, a simple task for anyone to, to be asked to carry out. I think that they did it admirably. It's not over yet. There's more. As a matter of fact, while we may have gone past the, the issue of health, we still have the issue of the economy to deal with. And that might be quite difficult for you to cont contend with. I'm in the opposition, and we have a government. Two separate roles. When they said that the legislature is responsible for holding the executive accountable, essentially they're talking about the opposition. So we hold the government accountable. The government's responsibility in this instance is to ensure that the citizens of this territory are protected. Protected from health issues, disease, and protected from economic breakdown. The treasury lies with the government. And your needs at this particular time can't be met through an economy that doesn't exist. It could only be met from a government. And the sooner the government realize that reality, the better off the citizens of this territory will be. And that's why we are here pressing the government to act sooner rather than later. I've said it before that it's already late. But then one of my colleagues said, better late than never, which we might most all agree upon. Something has to happen, and it should happen before the 28th. People are hurting, and they're not hurting because I say so. They're hurting because it's real. It's happening. I, have, we, I continue to remain an advocate for our citizens who have been trapped overseas, and I, I said before, and I'm going to say it now, again, that a government should make an effort to compensate folks who have been trapped overseas and not allowed to come back here to the territory for their expenses while overseas. Those expenses that were incurred. If other countries can go out of their way to repatriate their citizens, which means bring them home from wherever they were, we can certainly take care of their expenses while they are away. We didn't bring them home. We left, we left them out there to dry, hang them out to dry. I want to commend the leader of the opposition for taking responsibility to have this press conference and let the public know what we're thinking, how we feel, what our plans are for the future. And leader of the opposition, it's possible that I know that we have uh, restrictions as far as this whole pandemic is concerned, but it might be necessary for us to meet more frequent and monthly, and that's something that we can discuss. But yeah, of course. I think that it's, it might be possible that we might have to do that. I, I am glad that the media appreciates us. Uh, the, rep the correspondent for the Beacon indicated that it took, we took so long coming back. I didn't, I didn't think they cared, but I think <laughs> they, they, they did. So we, we're going to make sure that we don't, we don't leave you out there like that. Thank you. Again, thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for your comments, your closing remarks. I want to apologize before I go into my closing remarks for the member for the second who had a prior engagement that he had to, to be at. So I, I want to apologize on his behalf as well for my colleague, the memo for the fourth, who was unable to be here with us today. I, I too want to thank the media, more uh, first and foremost, for your engagement. We, we look forward to always engaging you because we think it's important for us to communicate with you, through you, to the people of this territory. And I also want to thank persons who were listening 
on ZB by radio persons who are online. Um, I've been getting feedback back and forth through my, my phone person have asked questions. I want to thank them for their, their engagement. Because the opposition, in, in my role as leader of opposition, we have a responsibility, a statutory responsibility, a constitutional responsibility to do the people's work and, and operate on behalf of the people of this territory. We will continue to do that work without being intimidated, without being, being um, um, pushed aside because we have a responsibility to you, the people of this country. Uh, we have done our part. Um, we've we've, we've uh, worked privately with the government. We'll try our best to work along with the government and their programs to ensure that we get the best possible outcome for you, the people. Uh, we're now going through, um, we, we, we've weathered the storm as we relate so far as it relates to the health aspect of, of COVID-19. Um, thank God we only have one active case now in the territory reported. Um, I'm, we're hopeful now that the, the more critical component now is our economy and the pain and strain that persons are feeling because of the lack of economic activity in the territory, that we need to get on with the business of the people of this territory in a safe, responsible way. I continue to say, and I'm going to continue to say this, that we need to learn to coexist as a territory, as a global economy, as a global community with COVID-19. It is, is, if, if it's incumbent on us to find the right protocols to keep our people safe, to keep our visitors safe, but also to keep our economy moving because our people are dependent on our economy. So I, we, we have put, off, put forward our proposals. They're, they're in no need, they're in no means exhaustive. Um, I'm happy that we've gotten feedback from persons within the community. The business community has reached out. Individuals have reached out with solutions and ideas. The yachting industry has reached out to me and have made their suggestions. And we want to continue that conversation. Um, one of the things that we're going to push to have is a digital forum, online forum with the opposition members and the public, the business community and the public, to ensure that we get all the ideas coming out from the public. Let us hear from you, you know, about your concerns and those specific issues that you are facing to ensure that they are incorporated in any plan, whether it's from the opposition or from government. We are going to be the conduit to the public if it needs to be to the government because we need to ensure that the people of this country and their voices are heard during this process. Again, um, I thank my colleagues for the engagement. Uh, we have a, a responsibility, as I continue to say, and we're going to continue to fulfill that responsibility. I think we were responsible in our actions in, in the early parts of this, this pandemic. We, we, we said to the government that we will work with you and, and ensure that you do the things that are necessary to keep this country safe. We suspended the requirements that are necessary to get house meetings going to ensure that whatever legislative frameworks or whatever core fuse needed to pass, that they were done. Uh, and we understand that these things are necessary sometimes, that we did what we had to do to facilitate this process. Um, and we are now here. Uh, I, I, my colleague has, 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 is, quite, is quite right. Uh, we need to engage you more, and we will engage you more. Um, the intent is to engage you more, and we'll work out the details in terms of how that would take place. But you will expect to have more conversation with us as an opposition, as well as conversation with the public. And we'll try to figure out the logistics surrounding that. I, too, would like to thank the people of the 8th District, um, the people from whom I come to this humble house to represent their interests. I am now leader of opposition, but first and foremost, I could not be anything else if it wasn't for those persons within the 8th District. I want to thank them, continue to thank them for the, the, the encouragement, their prayers, and the support of me as I continue to labor in the vineyard on their behalf and on behalf of the entire territory. Um, they know that they have a special place in my heart um, for the people of that community. They've given me so much, not just elected me to this house, but they are the ones that, that have brought me to be the man that I am in this territory through their support and continued love and support that they've given to me over the years. So I want to thank them for their continued support. And again, I look forward to further conversations with you, the media, conversation with the public. And we're going to continue to, to roll out specifics of our plan. Um, we're hopeful that, that at some point we have a sit down with the government to go over the details. Um, the, the actual plan document will be released later this week, is our intention. So you could then peruse the specific details in the plan. And, uh, and it's, I say it's a living plan. And we're getting information and feedback all the time from persons within the private sector, which is good feedback, and which is good that we now have this discussion, this healthy discussion that we need to move the country and the economy forward. Not just through, not just through the COVID-19 era, but beyond. We have to think beyond COVID-19, what we want the BVI to look like. 
what would a new BVI look like? And that has to be a discussion, not just with the elected members, but a discussion with the business community, a discussion with the people of the country. And that's a discussion that we intend to have as an opposition. Again, I thank you all. Um, God bless you and have a pleasant good night.